Heston Russell. Welcome to a roll with the punches. Hey Tiff, how you doing? Thanks for having me on. My favourite Australian veteran. Do you know how oh. old I think you are when I think of you as a veteran, a war veteran? Yeah, I know. That's the uh, stigma, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's so weird. I'm like, oh, what do I call Heston? And it just doesn't it's fit. It's just Heston. But this has been part of it, Tiff. You know, there's this stereotypical complex over what a veteran is and a lot of us don't sort of associate with that. We, you know, I grew up, my grandfather was a Korean War and Vietnam War veteran. Like These are legit proper veterans and you sort of, one, have an inferiority complex to that, but two, doesn't meet sort of that social stigma associated with what a veteran is. And that's why, you know, unfortunately, we sort of miss generations in these issues and only picture most veterans as, you know, old, grey-haired men and women. It's so true. Um, does it give you a bit of an identity crisis yourself? Uh, well, this is this whole piece where we've been really trying to support veterans in that transition from the military. You go through an identity crisis as it is because the military is so adept in uh, deconstructing your identity and reissuing you with a collective identity within a purpose and community and all those things that are before yourself. That's the whole you know, purpose of service. And then we do the great Australian way of reconstituting that uh, that uh, identity by your qualifications or your resume. And you're constantly comparing yourself to who you were in service through to, you know, rank, title, salary, all these sorts of things. And there's this sort of pendulum swing of between one to five years where most veterans, you know, require that time to develop confidence in, you know, Heston Russell, as opposed to any other label that's applied before, during, or after service. And that's that sort of real psychological issue we're trying to target and focus on these days. Absolutely. Like you were 17 when you stepped into that world. Hey. I was young. So <laughs> yeah, like. Looking back, mate, it's funny. You think you know things, but yeah, yeah, absolutely. Isn't it funny how we think of 17 year old now and they're children. I, like, yeah. I can't imagine. Oh, okay. 17 year old child. Off you go. Go what? learn to kill people and save the world for us. <laughs> I loved it. I was so independent. I mean, I went down to the Defence Force Academy for three years where, you know, every week was a white glove inspection, ironing your own clothes. You know, you really were proper in, independent. But, you know, I never even drank before and I had a fake ID that entire first year. And thank God I had those three or four years in Canberra to sort me out before I was an adult in the proper army, eh? Yeah. What sort of things is, I guess it's hard when you are, I mean, that's just the world you know, and at such a young age when you are just developing and developing an identity and growing in from, you know, from a boy to a man very quickly. Yeah. Um, what do, you, do you, when you reflect back now, do you think about the ways that it changed you really quickly or really profoundly? Yeah. Well, look, Good or you, bad? you touched on it then. And I, I have this, my own little, sociological and psychological sort of um, theories. So particularly you said it's like an initiation. Now, a large part of the issue within male society is a lack of initiation these days. And let's just grab initiation and think about it as some form of, of an event that turns your mindset from entitled to responsible. That's it. Now, women, in my opinion, go through this when you go from physically becoming a girl to becoming a woman, you have to take responsibility for your body because you can fall pregnant. Each month there are these physical things that happen to you. Mm. But most men, when they go through that pubescent stage, it's more of an entitlement piece. You're a man now, you can procreate, you can do all this. Oh, There's wow. not enough events or occasions within modern day society that a young man or a boy will go through an initiation where their mindset is, you're a man now, this is now your responsibility, so on and so forth. And the military in particular is specific on that. Because like I said, you go from being entitled, selfish, all these sorts of things to, you know, the team eats first before you, the mission comes before you, responsibility, you know, selflessness, the nature of service. And that is that huge piece that I went through at a very young age and was fortunate to do so, especially before becoming social and alcohol and all these other things that tend to perpetuate that entitled attitude. Yeah. I mean, that sounds... There's my little there's, theory for you. Oh, I love it. I love it. It sounds like there's massive, like, positive things to that, but also kind of terrifyingly negative. And I think about, 
you know, just processing mm, a sense of self and uh, a healthy, a healthy mind and a healthy, like emotional maturity. Oh, yes, thank you. I was yeah. like, how do I describe this? Uh, so this is where I struggled. So my service career was the best part of my life that helped to form Storm and Norm me to what I am today. And what I didn't realize is that it provided me with proactive layers of resilience. I think we we spoke about last time about, you know, having the team and having the mission provided me with two proactive layers of resilience wherever before anything could hit me physically or mentally, you know, my mindset was always out there and focused on serving and supporting those in that mission. Mm. And then when you, so I am very emotionally intelligent, how you need to, you know, leadership is motivating people through inspiration and caring for your people, you know, we're doing missions where you can't just simply yell at people to do that because the bullets and the bombs can be scarier than you are. And you have to actually intrinsically motivate people. Mm. But what I wasn't was emotionally mature because what I was fantastic at was compartmentalizing my emotions. I never had a, you know, relationship. I never had a boyfriend or a girlfriend. I never truly lent into and felt my emotions outside of those, which inspired me further for the purpose of the mission or my team. And then remove those proactive layers of resilience, go through essentially a bit of an identity crisis, figuring out who and what you are outside of service. What I didn't realize was I had never faced or addressed basic human emotions like love, enjoyment, all these things, because you remove emotions from your decision-making and everyday lives within particularly what within special forces was a highly combat um, and operationally uh, focused career. So as a 30, you know, three, four, five year old man going through my first relationship breakup, which happened at the same time as COVID lockdowns, everything else in mm. between, I'd never experienced and had to deal with and sit in my own emotions. Mm. And all of a sudden they hit you and they're stronger than anything you've ever felt beforehand. And it's so fantastic these days to feel, you know, mm. it's inspiring to be able to actually have, you know, this well up inside you and all that, but if you've never been trained the way I was at the elite level in everything else to deal with your own emotions, it can be overwhelming. And you're in that complex situation where you've always been the person responsible in charge at the front, blah, 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 and not in a place where you're comfortable being vulnerable, asking for help, all of these things. And this is this, you know, perfect storm of catastrophe for so many, particularly um, young men who are the highest suicide rate um, transitioning from the military. I love that. You, you touched on what I tend to ask a lot of people in first responder or, or um, you know, the army and, and police force around that idea of between when are we being vulnerable or when are we being resilient or when are we dissociating and when it, you know i was 29 when i stepped in the boxing ring and up until that point i thought i was i knew i was independent and strong and gutsy and this and that and all of the things and then after a couple of years of fighting and getting to kind of know myself in the ring and at realizing like i think bringing physicality and emotion and feeling back into my body in a physical space yeah. and then but confronting myself in a way i never had before i realized like i had some questions to ask myself and just like you i went oh like i'm terrified of love and connection and like this is not bravery this is not independence this is fear of, yeah. of some really big things like i i dug up childhood trauma that i'd suppressed for so long i wasn't feeling anything yeah and it took a few punches in the face <laughs> to dig that up. And it's like, so my ever present question is always, hang on, at what point, like, how do we know the difference between resilience or suppression of emotions? What's healthy and what's not? Yeah, I think it's confronting your own mortality, essentially. And I might sound funny coming from me, but I've never, I never ever felt fear for my own life during my service career. You know, if I died on operations, it was, it was almost sort of, you know, samurai culture glorious because you literally died doing what you wanted to do. I didn't want to be anywhere else in the world. Uh, and my guys, my team felt exactly the same. And it's confronting, yeah, that own, your own, your own vulnerability, but just trying to figure out, um, you know, what that means. And we don't particularly, you know, in modern day society, we don't have those conversations well enough. Um, I don't know about getting punched in the face over it. 
no, you're definitely right. And it's finding, for me, it's been finding others and particularly, you know, finding others like you that you find you know, relatable or aspirational to have those conversations with. Um, but it's constantly a work in progress, eh? Hey? Yeah, yeah. What, um, tell me about, about that process of leaving, leaving the, the army and coming home and, you know, how did that, how did you land in the middle of that? Oh, I love it. It was fine. Like, you know, again, you just so able to rapidly move on from one thing to the next, you know, my, I was trained, you know, at the high performance elite level to be an expert uh, in leadership and an expert in planning. So my mindset is always focused forward, 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 um, you know, to the, to the gr- uh, granular detail and constantly thinking over what ifs and what could happen. And that's how you develop that contingency planning and be prepared for anything to occur. But um, again, it was when sort of leaving and going to everyday society and appreciating, you know, not many people operate at that same level. Most people are motivated by extrinsic motivations, title, yeah. position, um, money, all that good stuff, as opposed to, you know, we had this proper intrinsic emotional connection to the purpose and to our team. But what you were touching on beforehand, sorry, I forgot to say, is that, you know, you talk about that bravery, courage, physical courage and moral courage. And throughout my career, I was so well adapted at providing and showing physical courage. You know, like I said, was never really afraid of um, anything I was ever faced because I had an amazing team. I was trained to an amazing level, all that good stuff. But then it came to that sort of moral courage. And, you know, even for me, it was, like you said, allowing yourself to be vulnerable with someone to have a relationship. My issue was I'd never done that before. So when it felt so good, my entire identity then became embedded to that relationship. A huge part for me was I was, you know, in the closet my entire military career for a variety of reasons, but mostly because I wasn't comfortable with who I was. And I then wasn't comfortable with society being able to focus on my actions and attitudes, not my label or sexuality when it got to that point come 2015, 16, 17. And then for me, I transitioned out of the military and got to live my authentic personal life, but completely disregarded my professional life because I was too afraid on how to piece them together because I'd never met another openly gay person in the special forces, let alone I was an officer. So I was responsible and in charge of people and all of this. And I didn't know how to do it. So I separated them and I hid one from the other. And, you know, and it took some big events for the world to come crashing together. And to be honest, it's still something I'm putting together because for most people, it doesn't match the stereotypes they know of either label special forces or gay. And that's part of the part I now love at the moment. It's leading into that. Yeah. And I think the the best way to achieve vulnerability, first and foremost, is just achieving authenticity, just to realizing who you are, what you stand for. You are human. You do make mistakes. But then the next level is being able to, you know, allow people to come in and help you with that from a place of responsibility as opposed to a place of entitlement. Oh, that is so interesting. Tell me about like how... Tell me about the moment, the moments or, or the transition between coming out and being openly gay and how long did you, how hard and restrictive was it to hide that? Uh, look, it was really interesting. I literally just finished uh, reviewing this part of my book that's coming out soon. It's all good to go. But <laughs> 2015, I was um, posted on exchange to the US Special Forces for a year. Um, as the only Aussie embedded within a classified task group. And I spent a year over there and it was fascinating for me because again, I was, um, you know, deeply in, in the closet hiding. I had a completely separate life. His name was Mike on Grinder, all this sort of good stuff. <laughs> but the only, I ne- I grew up in a pretty conservative family and I never actually encountered a gay person apart from maybe perhaps seeing something super flamboyant on the TV or whatever. And then when I was in Sydney, um, you know, I, I, I saw Oxford Street, which was midriffs and drag queens and very in your face, very effeminate um, sort of um, homosexuality. And I didn't associate with any of that. Then I went to the US 2015 and, you know, jumped on the old dating app and ended up spending some time in LA with a guy who sort of became, ended up becoming my first boyfriend, Matt. But in LA, I found a whole different culture where there were professional gay men who I didn't even know were gay until someone else told me. The first pool party I went to ended up being founder of PayPal through to, uh, you know, a Disney executive, all these like professionally gay men who had, you know, built proper lives. And I finally got to see the ability to do that. Wow. And 
But then I was sort of posted to the deep south. I was in Columbus, Georgia, and I really encountered the clash of um, religious beliefs and homosexuality. And at the time, uh, I was supporting that unit as they were allowing females to be able to apply for special forces, which was a first for them. But it was interesting, even in those conversations, it drew up these residual sort of this residual bigotry where people like, we can have women, but we're not going to have homosexuals type stuff. And then back in Australia, the gay marriage conversation had just commenced. So next thing, I come back to Australia 2016, the gay marriage piece is progressing. The Defence Force and society is looking for, you know, virtue signalling diversity, looking for people who are are diverse based on sexuality. And I put myself, you know, whereas I thought I could come back to Australia and live, you know, potentially sort of come out essentially, um, I put myself way back down in the closet because I didn't want people trying to promote or progress me based on my sexuality. I wanted to earn my place and my station, which is when you get your commando beret, they say it comes with a daily renewable contract and you've got to renew that every day. So 2015, sorry, when I was in the U S is actually when I called my mum and I told my sister that I was gay. Uh, that was it. And then 2016, when I came back halfway through, I ended up calling my dad and telling him, but, that's it. Like I never had a coming out. I never did a big no whatever. party. No party has to. No. Be. Well, I, what? Because the key thing I struggled with was putting those pieces together and also making sure it didn't turn into entitlement. Because a lot of people in so many different subjects, but like this, it's there's trauma there. There's trauma from maybe others have put you in the closet. For me, it was just struggling to understand and identify myself as it didn't fit any stereotypes. And when people come from a place of relieving trauma, it depends who those are around. You can very easily turn into entitlement. And I see that in the gay community. I see people, you know, attacking and and saying things about, you know, heterosexual people because they have felt traumatized themselves in some way. And it's preyed on by activists. It's preyed on by elements who profit off, you know, these stereotypes and stigmas as well. So it was really, it was such a great personal experience for me to go through that and then realize, and I didn't want to have a coming out because I'm like, hey, I want to dream of a world where you just are who you are and what you do in your personal life is completely up to you. And like my sister said to me when I told her I was gay, as long as you're not doing anything illegal and you're not hurting anyone else, you be you and do it for the right reasons. And that was, they're the best words that uh, that I've heard, but then when I went and had subsequent conversations with guys, when I got out of the military and they sort of started to notice um, my personal life, every single guy to a fault um, has been, you know, why didn't you tell us, dude? Like at the level we were operating at, you know, there's one, two or 5% of your mindset that was, you know, suppressing or holding yourself back. Imagine if you were able to put that into what you were doing. And that's, brilliant insight and that's my sort of purpose talking about these subjects is you being right with you and being able to put all of your physical mental and emotional energy into what you're doing as opposed to being worried about what others are going to perceive you are based on again a a label or a diversity that um, I didn't earn I was sort of born with yeah it's so interesting and it's so for for those of us who aren't in a minority of any sort it's it's really hard to conceive and you know it's only through conversations like this that I've had over the last two years mainly where we you know you get to know someone and then they'll they'll meant you know I've got a friend who's Sri Lankan I remember him saying once about this motorbike ride they went up to the this this pub and he walked in and and he made comment of sort of kind of being the only black guys in there and I was like what is that a, like is that a, what do you so is that a thing for you like because I don't see colour. I see this person I know and I, I was just so, it was not in my awareness that he walks around and when he walks into a place like that, that's that creates a visceral response. Yeah, right. And it's, you know, it's the same for you guys and it's so frustrating to know that, like, just hearing you kind of travel at different places across the world and have these different experiences and not, you know, think you can come back and be yeah. one way and then all of a sudden the the culture or the experience is that that you just you put it straight back deep in the closet again and and can't be you 
And also that's a part of that indoctrination into service. Like I said beforehand, I'm more than happy to put myself and my personal priorities last for the sake of the mission and the team. You know, it's irrelevant for me to say, hey, I'm gay, you must accept it. It's irrelevant to what I need to do. It's contradictory to the performance requirements that I need. And that's a place of difficulty for so many, particularly in Australian society these days, where you're taught, you know, you be you to damn with everyone else. Like that's entitlement. That's not responsibility. And it's actually just being smart and assessing the situations you're in. And it all comes back to what I was taught as a kid. You know, <laughs> I went to Sunday school, all those good things, but you know, I'm not an overly religious person, but I just remember the two things. Never judge a book by its cover. My mum used to say that to me all the time. Mm. And treat people the way that you would want to be treated yourself. And I just can't understand where we're at today in a society. Like, just Google me and don't read anything from the ABC or Sydney Morning Herald. And But all <laughs> these things, all that we constantly do is try and put labels on people. Special forces, gay, only fans, blah, 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 blah. Former politician, all these sort of things. Like, my label is Heston Russell and... The one thing I learned from my commando career is that I need to live by a daily renewable contract where each and every day I need to do my best personally and professionally, you know, be assessed on my character and confidence, my actions and attitudes. And people who sit back and rest on their laurels, people who sit back and rest on their ethnicity, their sexuality, any form of diversity that they did not earn, I have no time for. And I have a visceral, visceral response to anyone who approaches me with entitlement as opposed to responsibility. I ad- daily renewable contract i've written that down i love it that is something i feel like i'm going to kind of embed in my psyche and live by now yeah absolutely I, it's one of my favorite quotes again i'm gonna get you, i'm not plugging my book here i promise you but no, like please the, plug it because when does it come yeah. out because it's going to be self-published soon it's yeah, exciting hestonrussell.com is where it's going to come out it should be coming out um in time for chrissy i'm hoping to have pre-sales commence next month but um there's a you know you put like something in a book. I've put daily renewable contract and I've written a few lines of what that means to me. And that's literally something that I have up and that I reflect on. So, um, yeah, it's, yeah, it's tell just, me about, tell me about uh, the book writing process. Ah, uh, long, arduous, cathartic, brilliant, frustrating, creative. Cathartic. Absolutely. I'll level with you. I was approached by a big publisher start of last year and offered a contract, signed a full agreement, got paid in advance to do it. And then towards the three quarters way through last year, things started to get a little bit choppy with particularly the ABC and with some politics starting the political party and all that. And they ended up uh, withdrawing their agreement, but I got to keep my manuscript, which was about 80% complete. Yeah. And I just put it on the back burner because at that time we started up the Australian Values Party and got into it. And it's only since after the election that I've gone back to it. And I purposely have the book. It finishes Anzac Day last year, which was retaining the unit citations, which we campaigned for post the Burton Report release, and also the calling of the Royal Commission into Defence and Veteran Suicide. So it's before launching into politics. And it really is my journey in learning leadership and learning myself and the book uh, the working title at the moment is um, Special Forces, Sexuality and Suicide, An Unconventional Perspective. And it really is just my personal lived experience through those, through the lens of um, learning leadership. But it, you know, it's everything from a little bit of childhood, lots of combat stuff, um, including some pretty graphic details that um, I spent a lot of time speaking with the family members of one of my guys that I lost over there to get their approval yeah. uh, through to, you know, you know, my mental health decline, suicidal ideation, rebuilding myself back to this point. So yeah. it's a book that I wish I read many times throughout my life before reaching this point. But yeah, I'm looking forward to getting it out there. Oh, I've got goosebumps. I can't wait to read that. I got goosebumps when I sent it to the mother of um, Scott that I lost overseas. And uh, she just sent me back saying, I've had so many questions. This has helped me heal. Um, oh. Thank you for this. And she's also... <laughs> She's like, and my friend is a social worker and she says, this is a book that needs to be printed and read by every young Australian. I wouldn't go that far, but um, I'd be pretty happy if every young Australian read it. <laughs> that is so it, exciting. Well, hey guys, when you're wondering what to get me for Christmas, if you could just grab a copy of Heston's book and send it to me. HestonRussell.com. Get a <laughs> Honestly, the, what I have learned, particularly sadly when the publisher pulled out, is the whole self-publishing process is actually 
pretty pretty well done these days. There's different, you know, software that you need to do to format the book and all that. But you can really, if you want to get in there and write a book and for the right reasons, you can, you know, work your way through it. It's pretty straightforward as far as how to upload it as a, you know, paperback that can be printed anywhere around the world and sent people through to, you know, especially ebook, audio book. You know, we'll work on that later. Oh, you're going to do an audio book? You've got uh, a good audio book voice. Ah, uh, I might. Let's be honest. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the radio presenter voice. Um, <laughs> we might do that for like a, a re-release next year or something. But you can imagine that's just, that's hours and hours and hours of work to do, eh? Yeah. But hey, people like me, I'm 90% audio books. I'm with um, you. Well, um, the, fun, the funnest part for me also is using my website, HesterandRussell.com to also have pictures, image, and um, even video content from like my time in Afghanistan that will link to the book. And so, yeah, yeah, yeah. so there's a lot going on at the moment, but particularly by the time I release the audio book, which will be a subsequent release, I'll have included some extra like bonus content that I would have gone to the website and put on and give you more than, you know, you can actually fit into the words. I love that. You should do, you should do like a, there's two books that have done this. One is David Goggins and the other uh, recent one. Oh, I'm currently reading, um, reading when I say reading, I'm reading with my ears. Um, what happened to you by Bruce Perry and Oprah Winfrey? Cause I have him on coming on the podcast later this year. And they're, they're two books that in the middle of the reading, there's conversational points Oh, and Atlas of the heart by Brené Brown. If you have it. Oh, I love Bre- Brene Brown and Simon Sinek are my people. Oh, like okay. Brene Brown's conversations on vulnerability Amazing. actually have been huge in helping me better understand that conversation. Yeah. Well, if you haven't read Atlas of the Heart, that is an yeah. amazing book. So get, read that. Um, but she, you know, she gets in the middle of it and she reiterates part and she'll reread it. And there's conversation. And I love that because, you, you know, yeah. it's kind of like podcast meets book. That's what I'm going to do. Yeah, David Goggin and... Um, Gary V does the same in yeah. one of the, yeah. And that's, that's so going to be me. And that's why I probably need someone saying, Hey, hey stop, keep yes. reading. <laughs> yeah, there you go. You can get apps to do it. You can get apps to be the, the voiceover interrupting and hey, love pulling it. wisdom out of you. <laughs> what do you, what do you want to change? What do you like in the next five years? What do you want? What impact do you want to have? What do you want to see and make happen? Uh, Look, I am, oh, it's actually been really difficult, particularly the last few months post the federal election tiff. Like I'm a fifth generation veteran. And I say that because I feel that responsibility. Plus it's also the best version of me and all that good stuff that was through my life of service. But I really find it difficult to have a look around and see the amazing country we have and how entitled we are becoming, how reliant on our government we're becoming, how happy we are to outsource our decisions to the government and bureaucrats and how we have politicians who have literally been nothing but career politicians and we wonder why we're in these situations you know we have people who control uh, who lead through control not through leadership and inspire and you know my long-term plan hence raising the australian values party is a long-term goal to get more good people into politics people who have lived experience have emotional intelligence are able to understand and think through the impacts on the ground to people of policies and not believe that just being propped up by the media and press conferences is leading and motivating and managing uh, a country or a state or a, or a council region. So, um, you know, we've got the Victorian state election coming up. We've raised the angry Victorians party, angryvictorians.org.au. Uh, and that was, that was lessons learned from uh, the federal party, you know, values is still too aspirational for people. And while we had a candidate team of veterans and first responders who operate within a values based environment, immediately people thought we were religious zealots or we were racist or all these really? sorts of things. Yeah, I'd never realized it oh, before. Isn't that interesting? Well, a lot of people, unfortunately, aren't brought up. People a- rather be, val- be angry I- than have values. <laughs> Well, that's it. It was too aspirational. And that's because, you know, in the military, first and foremost, you're selected on values and attributes because then that's the basic building blocks Mm. where we know we have the right person. We can then train them to do specific missions or specific policies and all this. Whereas so many politicians and and people were elected based on, yep, we're going to give you free healthcare. We're going to, you know, save the environment. We're going to do this. I'm like, that's great. But what happens when 
there's a pandemic or a policy without precedence. It comes down to the person you have, what their values are and what their level of training is. But that's a bridge too far for most Australians who understandably don't want to be involved with politics yeah. and go and vote uh, and make up their mind at the last minute. So the angry Victorians party is more relatable. We're connecting with emotion, turning anger into pragmatic action to achieve long lasting change. And also it was a bit of a assessment from, you know, the amount of people who go in there and cast a donkey vote, the amount of people who will just vote for something cool that they see on the paper, because we don't educate Australians on our electoral system, but everyone's required to vote. So a bit of tactics involved there as well. Oh, I totally agree with that. I think I've always found politics at such a something that just reaches far deeper than my own knowledge. So I always have that sense of no matter how much I learn and know and, and look down, go down one rabbit hole of thought or information, I'm yeah. like, yeah, but like what are all of the ripple effects and what's true and what's not and what else gets affected by this choice? It's like... I think the same with the economy. Often, you know, when things like, oh, everyone's going to get a $900 grant or whatever, you know, there's some bonus payment for everyone to stimulate economy. And you watch people's reactions to entitlement of, oh, yeah, we got to get this money or I'm getting this money or whatever. And I'm like, yeah, but you, nobody's thinking further than, oh, I'm going to go buy this $900 thing, like this me. Like, what is, like, nobody thinks about the whole ripple effect of decisions. Well, that's this sort of byproduct of where we're at. It's a side at the moment, and I believe social media and so much else has a part to play that we're just so immediate gratification, short-term focused. And yeah. someone like myself, who's a long-term planner, it sort of does my head in because, you know, where's that $900 bonus coming from? You know, <laughs> <laughs> then we hear about a trillion dollar debt and, you know, people trying to tell you debt's a good thing for this and that. Like, it's not. Imagine what we could be doing if we were weaning people off government support and welfare and all of this and actually harnessing our resources and everything we have here in our country to actually make every single element you buy or put into your life cheaper, as opposed to putting cash on top of trying to afford things that get more and more expensive. We've sort of got things the wrong way around. You know, I again, lived a couple of years in the U S and you don't earn more in the U S you know, admittedly there's the U S dollar difference and all that, but things are cheaper. Things are available. Services are cheaper. All of this good stuff. You know, we need to lower the cost of things here in this country as opposed to keep trying to raise minimum wages and all the rest because you're just going up and up and up through the roof. And the issue is we're a country of 25, 26 million people with all of these amazing resources. We are never going to be able to outbid those who want to buy the stuff we have because we are the boutique shop that all the other rich countries who've been around for hundreds and thousands of years have the economies to be able to out price us on what we have, but we need to be long-term folks and go, Hey, it's better for us to have Australians a one tenth of the price. Everyone else not make that money as much for our economy, but we're still talking 26 million compared to 300 million in the U S and 1 billion in India. So we're talking, you know, 10 cents in the dollar to make Australians happier live more accessible lives, promote and develop ourselves and be able to, you know, fix all these social issues that come down to um, lower socioeconomic divides. So, such an interesting conversation. It just makes me think of a lot of the conversations we have about self-help and mindset and self-improvement and, you know, like finding the balance between spirituality and success or defining success. And it's like you look at, Australia and all of the things you've just said and then not that I'm pro or against the lockdowns I'm not going to open up that any COVID bloody opinions Anywhere. but but the effect of disconnection and isolation and stress and all of the things that we had quite long term like money can't like let's create healthy human beings with healthy healthy minds and healthy relationships and the, and business and money and life will flow on from that as well yeah absolutely you know in australia where people can go and get free health care including dental absolutely in australia where kids can go to school and parents don't have to work to the bone and australia where we are supporting parents to be at home and helping to raise and develop their kids as opposed to working two three or four jobs to get their kids a good education because education is one thing but it's lived experience and the 
at that impressionable time of a young people's upbringing that instills those behavior traits, that discipline, those standards, all the rest. You know, for me, the most important part is focusing on, you know, young people and how we raise the future generations of Australians. And that's where I'd love to, you know, in a country where we are so rich in all of these gas and coal and resources that we're pumping out there, to be able to focus at a social level on those key elements, um, being more proactive in our policy, in our health, in our welfare, as opposed to reactive and just building layer upon layer upon layer. Uh, you know, we have the ability to do that because we're such a huge country with such a small population, but we're just mm. terribly managed and our political system's out of date. We have layers of government. And this is where my mindset goes. You said defining success. My success is, you know, people being able to live happy, but also doing that with responsibility, you know, so they are going to go on, you know, we in the military is called train the trainer. You know, you don't, no point just training one person, you train someone who can then go on and train the next person and train the next person. And that's helping them to understand why and the purpose of the training, as opposed to the actual output of the training itself. And at the moment we sort of, you know, teach a man to fish, we're pulling up fish and we're feeding people. But we're not, you know, teaching them how to go on and do that themselves. And that's a huge opportunity we have while we're in, you know, this young stage as a country and to set up a system that can cater for when, you know, a thousand years times we're a hundred million people. Like we're not thinking about this. We're in a society that's thinking three and four year election terms and pulling ourselves apart over cultural issues based on all sorts of other things while other countries are planning a hundred years in advance and are thousands of years old and don't have to worry about all of these social issues that we do. And I don't agree with them, but that's the fact of the world while we sit here on our beautiful little island girt by sea. You're very wise and deep thinking for a young lad. I've traveled. I have the best part for me is I've had the perspective. Like I've, I've deployed to East Timor for seven months. I've deployed to Afghanistan four times, Iraq. I've traveled all over the world getting to see the worst, you know, I fought against ISIL, ISIS in Iraq, the most pure evil you'll ever face on this earth. And I've seen the most magnificent displays of human spirit, you know, from my guys and girls fighting it and just putting, you know, everything else before themselves in the service of our country. And I've got to just have that perspective. So then when I come back here and I see what we're fighting about internally, it does my head in. <laughs> <laughs> good without this is a weird question can we have good without bad yeah absolutely we can you know it's just like you know look at olympic athletes where they're focusing on refining and improving their performance as opposed to good versus evil you know we're getting to a stage and phase where people in society are focusing on improving ourselves and this is the issue we have in our country it's not toxic masculinity it's not anything it's toxic competition which comes from toxic comparison we're constantly comparing ourselves to each other as comparing ourselves and properly assessing our own effort. Are you doing these things for the right reason as opposed to, oh, they've got this, so therefore I want that. Like, do you need that? Why do they need that? We're constantly comparing. And again, even social media, we're comparing ourselves to our last Instagram post. We're comparing ourselves to our last engagement, the last downloads on the last podcast. We're constantly comparing as opposed to focusing on being and bringing our best every day. And again, that's that culture I left into this culture that we're now surrounded by. I, I've kind of got the giggles because I've been... <laughs> <laughs> She's off. <laughs> She's off. <laughs> I know. Because <laughs> I've been comparing my teeth to your super white teeth this whole that's... podcast going, I might get my teeth white and Hester's teeth look so lovely. <laughs> It's actually easier because I'm a bit more tanned in the face, whereas you're Casper the goat. So my, my face is the same colour as your teeth. Yeah. I'm just in, inverted. There's different tones. <laughs> <laughs> oh. my, my mother will be happy with the amount of money she spent on my teeth. <laughs> One thing I'm blessed with is I never had to have braces and people always comment on my straight teeth, so that's a bonus. Oh, wow. That is. I, I had braces and I have Invisalign. Oh, there you go. Eyes on the inside. Good on Thanks, Mum. Thanks, Mama Russell. Yeah, good to go. Um, can I ask you, lastly, yeah. um, you spoke before about, you know, suicidal ideation and really tough times. Yeah. Um, for yourself, and it'd be different for everybody, but for yourself, how did you 
how was that and how did you draw yourself out of that space? What helped? Yeah. So, I mean, I love this story um, because it's sort of the culmination of so much that has led me to some of the information I've just said beforehand. You know, my last position in the military was running the commando selection course. And we spoke about this before, but you know, you'll have thousands of people apply, 120 people will start the course. And at the end, about 30 or 40 might finish. And 90% of the people who come off the course, which is like a four week selection course, withdraw and request, they pull out a piece of paper that says, I wish to withdraw from this course. And uh, we do things that um, read the book, the love languages, the five love languages, mm -hmm. words of affirmation, physical touch, giving and receiving gifts, quality time and acts of service. Uh, and we basically structure every single activity on the selection course to assess an attribute like communication, teamwork, whatever, or, or and or also deny one of those love languages. We do silent running periods where you have no feedback, physical or uh, verbal or nonverbal feedback for three days. We'll send you out with a pack on your back for four days, you know, isolating yourself, doing all this and seeing people, we, we tear them back physically and mentally to reveal their emotional motivation and their emotional resilience. And people will sit there and assess why they're doing what they're doing and come over to you and say like, you know, I, I can't do this. My wife's pregnant or this isn't the right thing for me. Or, you know, I, I need, I've got so much more I need to go work on. And then, you know, you're all right, go put your gear in the, in the car and you drive off and five, 10, 15 minutes later, the person's like, Oh my God, what have I done? Whereas at that time, when they filled out that form, they were hundred percent adamant that that was the decision and they stood by that decision. Mm -hmm. But then when they're given time to reflect and come out of that headspace, they're like, what have I done? And that is the critical moment where we always have a staff member with them and we just talk them through what they just went through to help them learn and grow from that moment. Because it doesn't come from a place of despair. There's despair leading up to it in some form or another for sure. But it's that moment of absolute clarity where they literally take the action to withdraw themselves from the course. Mm. Most people have been in the military for four years. Most people have been up to 12 months training just to go on that course. And for me, you know, at what was it? March, 2020, you know, I returned from the US after just breaking up with my partner of four years and we landed to be the first flights where you had to go into self-isolation for two weeks. And then we were out for two weeks and then we went into national lockdown for two weeks and then he flew back to the US. And for the first time in my life, I was alone. I've always been around a team. I've always been in charge of a team. You know, the business I had was struggling so much because we had to close down from lockdowns and it was just me and my dog. And the whole time I was fighting with the Department of Veterans Affairs, I'd entered into this space of entitlement. I deserve this. I need this because I was left in this place where I had to validate and justify and reconstitute my identity based on, you know, what I was owed as a veteran to get my knee surgery, all these other things. And that Veterans Affairs process has got so much to answer for where it takes 18 months to five years for our veterans to sort of achieve some of their benefits and it turns you from responsible to entitled and adversarial and all that good stuff. Wow. And I just ended up sitting there one day after hearing about one of my guys uh, attempting to take his own life. And I had this absolute moment of clarity where I'd gone, that's it. I need to be the next veteran to commit suicide. I've got, you know, 50,000 people on social media. I've got all of this and I'll make sure I write a letter to Jackie Lambie, a letter to this person. I'll make sure I, you know, do things that will make sure that this, you know, captures media attention and, and this will be it. And for about half an hour, I wrote an email, I did all this. And as it goes, my dog came and put his head on my lap and snapped me out of it because he needed to be fed. I had this purpose outside of self again. And it was that moment of clarity where I read that letter that I'd written. And as I just said beforehand, I realized I had fully transitioned from those values that saw me being the best version of myself in service to being entitled to outsourcing all of my problems to the veterans affairs, to government, to this and that, looking at all the things that I could actually take a more active role in being responsible and taking charge of my own life again. And that's what sort of led me to the position we're at here at the moment. Oh, wow. Again, appreciating for that moment of clarity, I was back in Afghanistan planning a mission, you know, with my guys, I was so focused and inspired by knowing 
the perfect clarity of what I needed to do. And it didn't come from a place of despair. It just came from, you know, whatever needed to align and help me so realize the realities of mental health and needing to be more proactive in our mental fitness. You know, we go to the gym to keep us fit and healthy. We go to a doctor when something's wrong. The current sort of focus with mental health is, you know, we address it when there are issues as opposed to working on it to strengthen it, mental fitness versus mental health. And, you know, the requirement to you know be more proactive in that space and have these conversations and everything else in between. Yeah. And do you have moments of, and if you do, how do you manage the, the dips into negativity or struggle or disconnection or loneliness? Yeah. Good questions. I mean, it's been building that community around me and you, people say support network. I just call it community, whatever people divide yourself up into a pizza pie, you know, eight, 10, 12 slices, however many you are, and finding those people who you're able to make sure that every single slice of you is catered for in some element where you're able to be vulnerable with these purse people about this element, that element, that element. It's very difficult for many people to find one person you can confide in all those different elements. And particularly my issue, like I had with my former relationship, I tried to give that entire pizza pie to one person and <laughs> they were like, mate, I'm not hungry. <laughs> yeah, that's it. It's a lot. I'm not hungry for this. <laughs> and it's got to be that trickle fee. For me, one thing that COVID and all that really helped me realize was that the the love language that really hurts me the most when I don't have it is quality time. Like I need to be around people. Um, and unlike acts of service, which is the way I show love or the way I show value, I need to be around people who don't want anything from me, who are probably just actually going to hold me accountable. Otherwise I find myself trying to solve people's problems and do things for them as opposed to sit in my mm-hmm. silence and work on myself or have them help me sort of work on myself as well. So it's been appreciating. First and foremost, we need all those five different love languages in some way and people that provide that to us in some way, but then really focusing and understanding what impacts you the most when you don't have it. Um, and that's why I have a dog. That's why, you know, my mum spends time and friends spend time staying in my spare room, it, you know, and I, go about actively making sure that I'm out there being social as opposed to sitting at home where, you know, you can be more destructive being by yourself than constructive. Yeah. That's so interesting. Just yesterday I did a podcast on the love languages, hmm. um, but from an epigenetic. So I, I studied PH 360 epigenetics, which is yeah. profiling epigenetics and understanding. Crusader. You know, yeah. Oh, boom. See, I was trying to profile you before. I was like crusader or activator. Crusader I'm, or activator. I'm crusader with uh, heart seat. My friend, Sam, she's one all over it. I'm crusader with these other traits that make me softer and more emotionally intelligent. Boom. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Well, I had Anne Larson on, so she's one of the PH3s. So I had yeah. Cam McDonald on recently to oh, debunk. Cam, love him. Yeah. To yeah. debunk a whole bunch of kind of biohack scientifically yeah. research and like throw them at cam and go, all right, tell me per epigenetic health type, what these actually mean and what we can do. It's so interesting. So I'm a cam. I had him come in and actually give a presentation to all of our <laughs> political candidates during the last election. And we got them on part of the oh, program. As that well. is so that, good. So that's what, good. That's what it should be. We should be performing, you know, high performance and elite politicians as opposed to just, you know, policy puppets. Yeah. And understand, I think the other thing is you understand your own profile and communication style, but you have then awareness on, like you talk about the love language you give love with, as opposed to what you need love with. Like how many of us fumble around just not even understanding the difference or being aware of how, what language we're speaking? Well, this, look, this is why the commando selection course is designed to be the hardest thing someone would do in their career. And Again, I've been to combat and all that good stuff. And it is because it's something you often do truly alone and it's designed to make you feel truly alone. And it's designed to provide you with that perspective of learning about yourself. And sometimes it's the only time for people to do that. And it's then applying that perspective forward. And one of the first lessons I would teach the young officers who passed the commando course was I teach them the five love languages. And I would replace the word love with the word value. Because from a leadership perspective, as soon as you appreciate first and foremost, how you show and feel value and are then are able to assess that in your team and appreciate some people will feel value through literally putting a hand on their shoulder, some public affirmation, 
going over there and asking them what they're up to and spending time with them. And then you actually apply that into a leadership and management function. You will achieve emotional connections with your people accidentally through actually speaking to the way in which they achieve value. And that's how you build culture at the human level. That's how you really connect with people uh, with purpose. Uh, it's also able to be very easily manipulated once you know and understand <laughs> things if you want to. But again, self-awareness and situational awareness, learning and understanding mm. people you know, is the way in which we achieve excellence in anything. Um, but first and foremost, knowing and understanding that about yourself is literally that pathway um, that helps bridge from high performance to elite. Uh, well, I'm words of affirmation. So if you can see uh, what a great host uh, I am, that would be fantastic and well-received. <laughs> <laughs> you are. I mean, I personally believe your teeth are amazing as well. <laughs> I'm actually so envious that you've never had to go through the process of straightening them. That means <laughs> you're sorting. <laughs> Thanks, Heston Russell. Hey, what's your website again where people can grab your book and follow you and hire you to speak and whatever uh, else you do? Thanks, Tiff. HestonRussell.com. That's the first point. You can sort of go to socials and everything else from there and stay tuned. Coming soon. Awesome. It's been amazing. Make sure you shout out when that book is out and uh, I'll make sure all of our listeners know about it. Thanks, Tiff. Thanks for rolling with the punches. Go out there. And, uh, don't, Boom. <laughs> don't get smacked in the face too more, too many more times to have any more epiphanies, eh? <laughs> I'll I can't do my tell, best. No, I can't even tell that you're a boxer. Like, you must be a good boxer because you do not look like you've been hit. Look, I get hit a lot. I was my, I was more of a, I'll just punch more and harder for longer to win. And I could, I could weather all of the punches, but I have this straight, you can see that straight pointy nose. I don't know how it stayed intact. It's good, actually it? a miracle because I was, went into the sport thinking, well, you haven't got the best nose for this because it's terrible. straight nose, straight teeth. <laughs> I love it. You've got this, you know, these secret genes. We need to <laughs> bottle that. Plenty of black eyes though. Plenty of black eyes. We <laughs> deserve them though, didn't you? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I've been outside that. Out My again. coach definitely said that I did. <laughs> yeah, okay. We call that in the military. We call that a self-correcting fault. You know, like touching an electric pen. You only do it once and you don't need someone to tell you. The lesson uh, learned. Look, I'd do it three or four times, to be honest. <laughs> I wanted to really make sure it was a mistake. <laughs> I just love it. All right. Uh, You're a legend, Tiff. Uh, thanks, Heston. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.